All right. Well, <clears throat> Angel is right. I do talk loud. I'm right underneath this big thing. So if at any point, uh, please just, you know, raise your hand or shout or whatever. I also mum. So mm, um, I'm, a, I'm a deep, loud talker who mumbles. So we got that going for us. All right. So I'm logged into about seven Zooms right now. Let me just get rid of some of these. Here, is it? Okay, it, it sounded good in, in there, so. All right, um, fortunately for everyone viewing at home, they're only gonna see like this much of me right here. So that's good. And uh, let me just, are we gonna go for, oh, we're live. Oh, good grief, I didn't realize we were live. All right, well, let's get, let's get started here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share too much of my, there we go. Um, I am that guy who's doing a Prezzo from Google Docs. That's me. I'm the guy. And, and it's even going to cover up my screen. It's going to do all kinds of things. So here, this is this will be a first for me. Let's see if we can get into here, get into here, get into here. How does that look? Does that look, does that look ridiculous? Like, what? Can I, I can't get this stuff off the screen. Is that great? Am I off the screen there? I'm trying to get this off the screen. Get off the screen. And this dumb thing is going to stay here, isn't it? Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're uh, welcome. Look at that. Uh, uh, how many of you are here because uh, you thought we were going to talk about psychedelic mushrooms? Here, how many? There we go. Um, I mean, we can talk about psychedelic mushrooms, but uh, that's not the kind of mushroom extraction that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and uh, I just like to thank Live Oak Brewery for opening up your homes to us uh, here. I love Live Oak. Yeah, Live Oak, the first uh, moved here in 2008. I know there was barely anything here. It was just like dirt road. Uh, you know, Congress wasn't the the, the capital wasn't even built yet. And um, and Live Oak was the first beer I ever had, uh, first local beer I ever had. Still love the pills. That's that's one of my favorite beers. Um, here's what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we're just, just going to go through here. Uh, so just to set some expectations, uh, we're going to uh, just. I'm, does anyone not know what mycelium is? Anyone? Okay. See me after class. All right. You too. Great. See me after class. No, we'll we'll talk about my ceiling. I just want to get a basic, uh, you know, temperature of the room. Uh, for uh, this this guess, is this working or not? It is working. Oh, I'm I'm these people are ears are breaking right now. I'm messing with it. Um. Uh. Yeah, we'll go over like basics of fungal uh life cycle, fungal cell anatomy. You all have probably uh somewhat. Let's see, any greenhorns in here? Uh, probably know what a cell is and the basic parts of a cell. We're, we're not going to get too deep into that. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the reported health benefits uh, to consuming uh, uh, functional mushrooms. We're going to we're going to find out what, or at least talk about what makes a mushroom functional or medicinal. Yep, those are air quotes. Um, we are going to talk about the widely researched mushrooms uh, that are considered to be useful to humans. We're gonna talk about the various compounds that can be found in mushrooms that are beneficial or reportedly beneficial to humans. Uh, we're gonna go over how to access all these beneficial compounds that are found in mushrooms. In fact, found in all fungi. Um, we are going to go through some basic extract and tincture making terminology so that we can all know what we're talking about when we're talking about it. Uh, basic equi equipment and supplies. Um, any, everyone here live in a house with a kitchen or a domicile with a kitchen? Everyone? Yeah? Good. I saw three hands. Okay. Um, a, a taco truck has a is a kitchen. So we all live in taco trucks. Um, and then uh, I'm going to bore you with some single, double, and triple extraction methods. Um, yeah, I know. So yeah, save that for last. I knew I knew I should save that for last. I almost put it first. Uh, everybody would have walked out. Thanks. 
um, about the instructor. Um, so I don't know why I picked this as like a family trip down to Fort A and I, I couldn't get the ice and somebody took this picture and now it's my Instagram. Instagram picture. Uh, I am an amateur mycologist. I love that term, amateur mycologist. You know, I'm an amateur, you know, botanist. I don't know. I don't even know what that means, but uh, I I obviously have an interest in fungi. Um, I have had an interest in fungi uh, since I was in uh, high school, and um, I I found some some of my notes uh, from a notebook. Look at this. This is like letters from like. Abraham Lincoln, uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, like you can't, don't touch these. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it's my precious little objects. Um, but uh, at some point, my interest in, in, in fungi and mushrooms uh, escalated to the point of uh, selling psilocybin or psilocybe mushroom spores uh, out of a, a, a classified ad in the back of High Times magazine. <laughs> And, and that was, my hands were tied though. Uh, it was purely because of the abundance of these mushrooms uh, growing up in Southeast Louisiana. Um, and I had a buddy who, let's just say, liked to collect a lot of them and have them on hand for various things, uh, research projects. And he would, uh, in exchange for bringing me like a, a, a Schwegman's bag, I know what a Schwegman's bag is, right? shopping bag full of them um, where I would lay them out. My parents had no idea what the hell was going on there, but you know, it wasn't, you know, like uh, I wasn't smoking cigarettes. So, <laughs> um, and I would, uh, I'd lay these things out and this is just how naive I was at the time, but I had, you remember those, uh, are you probably even find them now, these like cube notepad things, you know, it's like a cube. It's no pad. It's impossible to write on, but it looks really cool. Everybody would have them on their desk and proof patterns printed on the side. So my dad worked for a publisher and we'd just get dumb stuff like that that he would give to booksellers and be like, hey, get the new Barbara Cartland romance. Here's a cube, you know, with Barbara, Barbara's picture on the side. And as you peel it off, she like disappears. So I would use those completely unsterile, unwashed, on anything. And I would just lay them off because they were the perfect size. So I had to lay them on a table and put all the caps down. I'd roll some paper towels over them and come back later and I had all these beautiful mushrooms or purple, brown, gorgeous spore prints that I would then fold in half, stick in one of those little manila change envelopes, you know, lick it, lick it, <laughs> seal it and, and write P. cubensis. At the time it was Stripperia, I think, cubensis. And, um, and then just write for research purposes only. I think I had a, a rubber stamper made, you know, at the off, off supply store. And everybody in the back, everybody in High Times was selling these things for ten for for twenty bucks. I sold them for ten. And the uh, the the uh, uh, this is before the internet, so you know there was no feedback loop. I didn't hear I didn't hear how poorly everyone's uh, experiments went. But basically, uh, yeah, the, the post office said get a bigger PO box. So um, uh, anyway, that went on until I. Oh, and here's some of my notes. Look at these are typed out on a on a on a royal typewriter. If if you remember what a typewriter is, um, look at this dikaryotic mycelium. Who was thinking about dikaryotic mycelium when they were sixteen? I not I don't know, but there it is. You know, literally. Uh, I mean, I was, and, and look, Bob Harris is uh, growing wild mushrooms. Look, I'm plugging Bob Harris. Um, here's some more, you know. These are, I literally would go and, and Xerox these things and, and wrap them and stick them in the envelopes and sell them. I, I would ship these for a, a stamp. Um, it was just so ridiculous back then. Um, and to be fair, psilocybe mushroom spores do not contain psilocybin. They don't contain any Schedule One drugs or anything. And everything was for information purposes only. And then eventually we got a letter from the government. And, and then my my dad, my dad has the same name as me. My dad is senior, I'm junior. And uh, we our, our company was Nuke Force Labs. Uh, and I was like, look at this font. This looks kind of medical, 
scientific, <laughs> let's use that. It was like the lecturer said you had to smear down onto the paper. So uh, we got a letter that just said, you probably shouldn't do this. And, and I don't even know which government agency, but my dad was just like, you're going to get your mom deported. She wasn't a citizen at the time. And I was like, <laughs> that's, why, that's why this letter is such baloney. Dear friends, Nuke Force Labs was recently informed by the federal government that we must close down all operations immediately. However, you can still purchase philosophy sport prints from the remaining supply at $4 each. You know, the remaining supply was as many as my buddy Roy would bring over. You know, boom, I'd do those. And then, oh, and I built a dehydrator out of a giant, you know, Bubba uh, shrimp boat uh, 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 ice chest and a light bulb, you know, just lined it with foil and put cookie sheets in there. So I would give him back powdered mushrooms he would bring me. And it was just a wonderful symbiotic thing. Uh, these spore prints are proven fertile. I don't know how they're proven. Uh, I was growing them, but whatever. Growing mycelium. And are still sealed in the original packaging. We're very sorry about this short notice. Thanks, Nuke Force Labs. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, just a little bit. Uh, I'm also a tinkerer. You know, I always have to know how things work. Uh, I'm a born skeptic, so you have to prove it to me. Um, and I, uh, will try anything once. So, uh, the, my, my interest in fungi started because I saw them and I got a camera and started taking pictures of them. Then I started, then I got a book growing wild mushrooms, I think was the, um, was the book and, uh, went into the honey Island swamp, beautiful, gorgeous, natural area in Southeast Louisiana where it was just a fungal paradise. I mean, just mushrooms everywhere, tripping over them, edible mushrooms everywhere. So I would pull uh, angel wings, oysters, you know, all sorts of stuff out of there, bring them home and cook them and eat them. Um, and so uh, I, my life took different directions, blah, blah, blah. I eventually kind of came back to my interest in here. And here we are. Um, here is the mycelium. Who are, who are the people who didn't know the mycelium? One, two, three, okay. Uh, so everybody knows of uh, mushrooms, right? We're just going to go with this spike and cat mushroom um, and what with gills. But yes, they have, they're all different, I know. Um, but we're just going to use this just for an example. Um, so we know that there's this circular uh, uh, thing that happens with the life cycle. The gills are lined with basidia. They drop spores. Those spores will germinate, creating... Uh, hyphae, those hyphae go, go out, try and find each other, find uh, like-minded uh, uh, hyphae to get together with, and they start all wearing hats and have armbands and stuff like that. And then they form a mass called a mycelium, okay? And that mycelium will just continue to grow and flourish. Uh, sometimes it builds mycorrhizal relationships with trees. It does all sorts of things. So eventually, if the, the conditions are right, it will create these uh, primordia. Um, those primordia will sometimes turn into little tiny baby mushrooms, which then grow up and start that whole cycle all over again. Um, the important part to know really about all of this uh, is not a chicken and egg thing. It's more just that uh, pretty much every part of the mushroom is comprised of the same thing. Um, it's all mycelium, it's all hyphae, it's just in different stages of its existence, if you will. Um, the, uh, the, the, the current landscape of mushroom, medicinal mushroom and all of that is a, a war zone between the fruiting body people and the mycelium people, you know, and it's like, Mars are better, Mars are better. And, and then you look at the research and it just says they're all better. Like they're both better. Like, okay. All right. So, but I get it. It's marketing and there's a ton of money being made right now. Uh, can I ask how many of you are buying commercial products like mushroom products? Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on. Look at this. I didn't buy this. It was given. So looking at all of you. Um, mushroom coffee, right? We're all going mushroom coffee crazy in this country. Mushroom coffee. Um, you, you could make mushroom anything, mushroom soup. Um, 
So, uh, uh, so there's a ton of money being spent on that. But in, and you also know how much this stuff costs, right? It costs a fortune. And it's instant coffee. You're paying a fortune for instant coffee because you love the taste of instant coffee. I'll drink Chevron coffee. I don't, you know, I'm only that coffee person where it's like I've got every device to make the coffee, but you know, I mean, styrofoam cup Chevron coffee. Is good. Actually, pit stop, uh, go get my oil changed. They've got that thing. I go like at three in the afternoon. They got that, that urn that's just sitting on there baking. You can see where the line was and now where it is stack of styrofoam cups and I'm like, pour me a hot one. Yeah. one. Um, so yes, we're, we're, we're doing a lot. We've gone mushroom crazy, a lot of mushrooms, yeah, getting into everything. And the reason being is because of all sorts of very uh, unique things uh, that are found in uh, the fungal cell walls. So uh, down here in the bottom right, uh, we've got basically the tip of a hyphae um, and uh, let's just say that the green band at the top, those proteins, that would be like the edge, the outer edge of the cell wall. Um, the proteins there are manoproteins. They basically function like sensors. So they sense, is this food? Is this another organism? Uh, is it foe? You know, is this a mycorrhizal relationship? And so they send the information back and forth, like, do I need to produce an enzyme that will metabolize the thing I'm pressing against? Do I need to provide some nutrients and see if this thing will give me some sugars or whatever back that I need, et cetera, et cetera? Or do I need to produce some novel antibiotics to eat, you know, kill and then uh, produce some, some enzymes to eat the thing? Remember, mushroom stomachs are on the outside. They're, we're just like that. They're just like us except their stomachs are on the outside. So everything they touch is potentially a, a meal. Um, uh, right underneath that would be this layer of uh, interlaced beta glucans. That is the, the super exciting part of, of, of all mushroom uh, research right now and is the predominant sort of um, component that you can extract relatively easily from all mushrooms. All mushrooms contain beta-glucans, some a lot more than others. So it's just something to know about. Um, tightly bound, and I love that this graphic, I, I just found these graphics, so I, I, I redid the type because I didn't like it. Uh, but uh, I like that these are, are uh, designed as bricks because that's what they are. This chitin is this really, really tough polymer that is binding the beta-glucans to the cell membrane. The cell membrane is what separates the inside of the house from the outside of the house. Inside are all of the vacuoles and, and, and all the other uh, nucleus and the other various uh, the, the, uh, uh, components and, and, and cytoplasm and everything that uh, keeps the, the cells alive and then does this little transfer of either resources or information, ergosterol is part of that process. These transmembrane proteins as well. There's uh, the beta-glucan synthases where that actually produce the beta-glucans or, or collect those and convert them into the form that is needed to build the cell walls. And the reason that these are, um, these are designed this way is uh, because these fungal cells are growing in that dirt right now. You know, the, the heat, they're in there. They're, um, they're penetrating this wood. You know, the hardest wood on earth can be broken down by these uh, very, very uh, clever little uh, organisms. And uh, uh, I got down into a rabbit hole with uh, ergosterol, or, or, or but really, um, antifungal um, research. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of mycopanic out there, you know, and, uh, you know, some of you may have seen a TV show, you know, and uh, other things, other reasons, uh, the, the, the soot and uh, the, what is it, the whiskey soot, you know, and, and Jack Daniels whiskey soot. Uh, I just look at those pictures and think of those people's lungs. Um, so there's a lot of reason to be worried. Um, and our bodies do have a lot of receptors that fungal 
components fit into conveniently. So uh, ergosterol is one of the things that are uh, targeted and also other interior cell, um, cell wall components are targeted by antifungals, create little cracks in there so that the dam breaks or the wall breaks and things start seeping out. So it's, if you wanna go down a rabbit hole, just that's a, that's a really fun one to go down. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, this is, you know, just sort of like a basic overview and also just sort of give you an idea where these things are located that we're going to be talking about. So what does make a mushroom functional or medicinal? Um, mushrooms are already a nutritional superfood. Come on, look at it. They contain B-complex vitamins, B6, B12 panthenic acid, thiamine, riboflavin, minerals and trace minerals, iron, copper, zinc, high quality protein contain all essential amino acids. Don't listen to those meat eaters. Dietary fibers, <laughs> dietary fiber, insoluble and soluble, up to 95% in some species, the most of any food by dry weight. So why not just cook them and eat them? Well, yeah, cook them and eat them. That's exactly, absolutely. Get all that good stuff in you. There are few foods on the planet that are this nutritious by weight. Now, mushrooms are 90 something percent water. Okay, so by the time you get them down to their dry weight, they, they don't really seem like much, right? And then cooking them sometimes kills off the B vitamins. Okay, some of those B vitamins are, are, uh, are, are heat sensitive. Um, a lot of the fiber that's in there is trapped up, bound up in these these proteins bound by chitin and things like that. So they're not readily available. Now, if you, to say cook, if you cook, let's say, cut up some shiitake mushrooms and put them in a pan and put some water in there. Let's say you fill up the pan and then you cook it, you boil it on high until that pan is almost empty. And then you squeeze those shiitake mushrooms out and then eat the shiitake mushrooms. And then what you have left over is gonna be a lot of those beta glucans, all right? A lot of the things that get tough, but you have to cook them to the point where you probably don't wanna eat those mushrooms. You know, they don't taste good and they're just mush, mushrooms. Yeah. Um, what are the reported health benefits of consuming mushrooms? Here's a, here's a typical, um, I can't get this stupid thing out of my way. Here's a typical one of our fungal medicine, mushroom medicine people, um, uh, uh, companies. And you know that uh, everybody is aware that Paul Stamets is the, the, the Pied Piper of uh, mushrooms. This is his company, or at least he's a, a part owner in this company. Um, this is what they have to say. Uh, some of the, uh, you know, look at the asterisks next to everything. Um, this is what they have to say that agaricon, you know, is supposedly, the research on that is supposedly off the charts, but it's really, that's the, the only thing that it's really just crushing right now is that immune response. But look at reishi over here. I mean, just relax, you know, yeah. just, oh, it's like my older sister, just, oh, overachiever, you know. I'm the, I'm the agaricon, I'm the maitake, if I'm lucky, you know. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, pretty much all of this stuff has clinical research, whether it's in vivo, whether it's in vitro, whether it's uh, with, um, you know, uh, 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 placebo, double blind, all of that. Um, you really have to chase the research yourself. And the good thing about that is that this the handful of companies uh, and I'm just showing you post defense. I don't feel any one way or another about any of these companies. Um, these are nutritional supplements, right? Anybody here taking turmeric, right? Making turmeric tea. Anybody here, uh, he was eating way too much garlic 10 years ago, you know, whatever. Like, you know, we, do, we just go through this and um, these claims have not been you know, verified by the Food and Drug Administration, right? Well, we take it anyway, and we buy, and we spend thousands of dollars on this stuff, right? Um, so on the one hand, getting that FDA approval is, is a bit of a mountain to climb. So I, I get that much. And I'm not 
saying, actually, what I'm saying is hold these people's feet to the fire, right? Um, it, it's important to, we're all going mushroom crazy. We all think mushrooms are going to save the world, right? They may help us save the world, but if the world's saved, you know, from ourselves, at least, it's going to have to be us. Um, and uh, and so, you know, th this is a very typical sort of chart and breakdown of what some of these mushrooms um, at least have been reported to do. So what, these are the most that I've found the most widely, oh my, wow, my indents are way off. Oh, grief, I should have put my uh, royal typewriter uh, thing up there. That's a good half inch. Um, so these are the ones that are most widely uh, uh, researched and um, and have at least uh, multiple sort of confirmed uh, uh, you know benefits. Chaga, cordyceps. Uh, who here? Show of hands. Takes chaga. Anybody taking chaga, drinking taga tea or anything like that? How about cordyceps? Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, lion's mane. I'm sorry. What did you, what are we talking about? The lion's man joke, reishi. Uh huh. I know this is the same hands because you're all picking this thing. <laughs> um, uh, shiitake, or as my daughter says, shit, hockey mushrooms. Um, and turkey tail, turkey tail, and anyway, one turkey tail. Oh man, that's the best one. Um, Compounds. I know it's the least. It's like the most plentiful. You could probably go out and find like on these grounds. I could probably go and find a pocket full of dried, you know, turkey tail uh, on, on these grounds right here. They're so plentiful, especially in central Texas, and they are great decomposers of invasive species like ligustrum. And things like that. Um. So the compounds that we are really excited about, the majority of the uh, research is in beta-glucans and chitins. These are polysaccharides, polymers that are not digested in our upper GI. So they get a chance to pass into the lower intestines where they're absorbed by these ancient receptors. I love talking about ancient receptors um, because the fungi were around and these receptors were around in our, in our anatomy at the same time. So just like other mushrooms, where there's a plug, there's a there's a, a plug that fits into a socket, you know, that's always been there. Uh, anyway, these receptors called ma macrophages, uh, they'll break down uh, beta glucans and these little activated particles that then go and attach themselves to baddies like viruses, bacteria, tumor cells, and things like that, and basically mark them. And what happens is they're like walking around, and all of a sudden they get attacked by antibodies, they get attacked by natural killer cells, T cells, whatever it is because they had a sticker on their back. You know, they had a kick me sticker on their back. Uh, the macrophages are also mobile, so they can transport these particles to danger zones. They can get into the marrow of bones. They can, you know, cross organs. It, it's a fascinating thing. That's another wonderful uh, rabbit hole to get down into. Um, terpenes, uh, phenolic compounds, these are much lighter uh, molecular weight compounds. Terpenes are hydrocarbons. You probably hear about terpenes um, from the cannabis industry. It's all about terpenes. That's the to to what you know. Uh, uh, let's say uh, what uh, tannins are to wine. You know, terpenes are to cannabis. Uh, so it's super hot. Um, uh, a lot of research around that. But uh, fungal terpenes um, lo located in the organelles, like the vacuole, the uh, Golgi apparatus, all those things. Um, have shown uh, anti-cancer, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti, 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 um, and they come in many forms. So like monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, diterpenes, triterpenes, and the thing to know about that is, and there's actually starting to be a lot of research around uh, diterpenes and triterpenes in lion's mane mushrooms. Um, because those are showing even more activity in the sort of neuroregenerative, uh, uh, you know, playing fields. Um, the thing is, is that uh, along with these phenolic compounds um, that pretty much have the same thing, some of these are familiar, like tocopherols, flavonoids, phenolic acids, polyphenols, 
you've probably heard about these from other foods, other superfoods. Um, the, the thing to know about these is that the beta glucans and the chitin, to get to those, you need to boil the you know what out of them or pressure cook them. In fact, pressure cooking is much faster and can get, get to where you're going faster. Uh, whereas the terpenes, phenolic compounds, some of them are, are, uh, um, are, are accessed uh, by heating, but most of them are, are lower weight and will either get destroyed or evaporated um, using heat. So really it's just kind of like what it is that you're going after. But if you kind of look at these benefits, um, it's hard to go, mm, I wanna, I wanna like activate my uh, immune system and my natural killer cells, but I don't think I wanna, you know, do any anti-aging stuff. You know, it's not, there's very few things on here that you could have an argument against, you know, uh, uh, accepting a benefit of. Um, so I kind of look at it as a, uh, a sort of, uh, what's, what's a good metaphor? Uh, I was gonna say a <laughs> hand grenade. Um, uh, for, uh, I, you know, it's a, it's, it, why is everything like like war? I was going to say buckshot. You know, everything is like in Texas. Um, it, it's a it's a big we're we're a big target, and it's hard for this stuff not to hit part of us that that doesn't help us. Let's just put it that way. Let me hurry up and get out of that that metaphor. Um, so, how do you access the benefit, beneficial compounds found in mushrooms? Um, so yes, in order to become bioavailable, available, these compounds need to be made into an extract or a tincture using the dried fruiting bodies of mycelium or fungi. And what about efficacy? Oh, I don't know. Let's go over here and talk to our friend Paul Stamets and ask him about efficacy. They'll tell you it can't be measured accurately. Let's go to another thing, another uh, mushroom medicine dealer, and they'll say that there's no. You test it, and it's you're going to get different results. So we don't talk about the uh, the beta glucan chitin. So again, that's mushroom speak for we don't know, right? And we're using more rudimentary processes that don't yield predictable results. Okay, everyone in this room, if you follow what we're doing. We're going to be using rudimentary processes where you cannot predict the results. Okay. But we're starting with some materials that it's almost like you can't fail. All right. Like these things are so chock full of good stuff that you, you really can't fail. So I kind of look at it as there's not much of a downside. I think if you have some kind of renal condition or if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, well, well, well. those things are probably things like everything else, like Advil, you should probably talk to somebody before you take it. And I'll also say that like, this is all my opinion. The views and expressed on co-op radio are not the views. Sorry, I do a show on co-op radio. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, get these guys off the hook. So how do you get these? Well, you could use a Soxlet extractor. Look at that, man. I cannot wait. I'm on eBay right now. I'm on eBay going, oh, I want one of these so bad. Look at that. I know. It's just a gorgeous piece of glass. Look at it. That's like 17 pieces of glass. How is that going to ship? How do you get that to me? A uh, guy with a storage unit in Bastrop. Um, so yes, this is, uh, this is sort of how they do it for all of these studies. They've got to use these ridiculous um, it's got like a, a, a column reflux still practically built into it. It's extracting it into this little paper filter. So you actually get dried extracts from these that you can then you do all sorts of spectrometer analyses or whatever it is. Anyway, uh, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it a different way. We're gonna do it a very basic way. So let's talk about how we're gonna do this. Uh, any herbalists? here or herbal medicine people. Okay. 
Okay, thanks for the warning. Right. I'm going to say all sorts of wrong things, and you're going to be like, oh, God, he called an extra drunk a tincture. Um, so uh, I went ahead and uh, cleared that minefield by blaming Wikipedia for all these. So there you go. Go yell at Wikipedia. Uh, tincture is basically just an extract of a plant or, <laughs> I love this, extract of plant or animal material dissolved in ethanol. Animal or plant? Yeah, come on, man. Wikipedia, that's your crowdsourced. Uh, crowdsourced encyclopedia, there you go. I'm gonna go in there like, or from you. Then I get the answer. Um, uh, solvent concentrations, ethanol, by ethanol we mean uh, ethanol. So it's something that can be consumed by humans at the right dilution, not isopropyl alcohol, not denatured alcohol, not any other alcohol. Um, concentrations can run 25 to 60 percent, but it may run as high as 90. Uh, chemi chemistry, a tincture is a solution that has an ethanol as its solvent. Basic thing there. Extraction is a separation process consisting of the separation of a substance from a matrix. There you go. It's easy. Um, an extract is the resulting uh, uh, substance. Uh, and uh, blah, 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 part of a raw material often using solvents such as ethanol, oil, or water. And we're going to be using two of those things. And I'll let you guess which ones. A solvent is a substance that dissolves a solute, resulting in a solution right here. Um, mark is the. Uh, insoluble residue remaining after extraction of a solution uh, with a solvent. So basically what's the mushroom mass that's left over is the mark. And if you're dealing with uh, uh, plants or anything else, you know, the mark is just the thing that's left over after you've squeezed all the good stuff out. A decoction is a method of extraction by boiling herb, again, herbal or plants. Yeah. Herbs are plants, uh, which may include stems, roots, bark, and rhizomes. To dissolve chemicals of the material. All right. Up to this point, anybody have any questions? I mean, we're not going to talk about psychedelic mushrooms. So, you know, um, but anybody sort of miles away from where we're going at this point, feel free. I'm here. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, good. So, aside from just what's in your kitchen, and some of this stuff might actually be in your kitchen. Um, the, here's some equipment and supplies you're going to need. Um, Everclear is just one of many 95%, uh, 190 proof uh, alcohols that are on the market. Uh, Mohawk, diesel, they just sort of change uh, uh, night. And there should be virtually no difference between them. They are literally pure alcohol, almost, and um, uh, most likely GMO, most likely corn uh, that they're made from. So if you're worried about GMO, uh, there are sources of uh, uh, high proof ethanol that you can get. If you noodle it, you can find those um, that don't use any GMO. There's also ones made from other grains besides corn. Um, you're going to need distilled water. We brought distilled water. Um, and the reason we use distilled water is because it's just H2O, nothing else in there. And I have distilled water all over my house, squirt bottles, you know, if I'm cooking, if I'm doing some spraying, I, I'm spraying, I, just, just, I spray distilled water everywhere for no reason. Um, mason jars and rings. That's right, regular old mason jars and rings. In this uh, class, we're going to be using or workshop, we're going to be using half pint. Uh, these classic, you can, if you wanted to get the quilted crystal, you can be fancy. Um, uh, Cheesecloth um, and uh, a cold brew coffee sack, nylon or cotton grain bags. I'm a home brewer as well. So I have all kinds of things. Look at this. How many times has that been used for like some weird roasted barley thing? Um, Anyway, these things are nylon ones are pretty, you know, innocuous. 
Uh, if you don't like plastic, this is another one. This is super fine mesh. Um, if you don't like plastic, there's you know all these um, unbleached cotton cheesecloth. Do the exact same thing, right? Um, and then yeah, grain bags kind of here. If you buy the 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 spice uh, kit, if you make pho at home, it comes with a little sack, you know, like that. Look at that. This is that. Uh, so anything like that really uh, is what we'll use to to strain the mark and strain all the uh, the liquor the liquids out of the out of the uh, mixture. Um, various other things like a blender, and I realize that for you uh, uh, watching at home, uh, no one can see this yet, but. Um, here's your classic garden variety Costco on sale blender. It's big. It's got all these nasty blades in it. So um, uh, mushrooms are not easy to work with. Um, a lot of them are really tough, like reishi. Um, so this is sort of like half food processor, half blender. These are great. Um, so any brand that's reliable. This has an acrylic or ly uh, lycan, or I don't know what this is, uh, Lexan. Um, uh, but I don't know if you can even buy a glass blender anymore. Um, and then, uh, or you can use one of these medieval tools that I don't know. Um, I'll cut some fingers off. What did I do? I leave it going. Oh, right. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. Um, this, you know, this is an option. You don't have a blender, but you happen to have one of these. I want to know what you do for a living. Um, and that is an option too. Um, uh, as for, you know, just kind of going back to the thing, which I really think is right. funny. Um, I like to have a variety of these uh, jars. These half a gallon uh, jars are available pretty much anywhere now, mason jars. Um, these uh, half pint jars are available everywhere. The wide mouth pint jars are fantastic for this kind of work because they have a wide mouth and the uh, quart jar, wide mouth quart jars as well. So I like to keep a variety of these things because you're constantly having to hold something while doing that. Um, what else? Stainless steel strainer and stock pots and things like that. Uh, these are all like, you know, everybody's got this stuff in their house. This is literally my setup. Like I put the stuff in here. I don't know why I use both of these. I could, I could use one, but I, I feel safer. I feel like I've had this for so long and the handle broke off when I bought it. And now I just keep using it, finding uses for it because I'm so mad at them. Um, I put this, I put the thing in there, put this on top of it, and then I lay a cutting board on it. And then I just put my arms on it and I just kind of lean. And eventually there's nothing else in there. And you're working with stainless steel. It's quite important to see in the glass and stainless steel. Um, when we're dealing with things like this, um, just uh, just in case, if it's easier to clean. Um, anybody know what this is? Come on, come on, asparagus steam, right, right. You know what? You know where I got this? I got this at a thrift store. Why? Because somebody got this for Christmas. And I'm like, oh, crap, asparagus. <laughs> Do it in this. You know what? I need asparagus here. Even came with a little thing and fits inside and asparagus and all that. This is I use this for everything. It's it's it holds a little more than three quarts, and it's great because tall and skinny, I can see how far I've reduced something if I'm boiling it really easily. Um, so big fan of food stores don't pay suckers pay retail, right? at the line. Um and then uh, brown and blue and or blue glass bottles. Um, look at the source of three brown bottles. Yeah, H-E-B, baby. Um, 
uh, I use these, I buy these things and I just, yeah, I make my own iced coffee, but you know, whatever. I need Brown Glass to store stuff. And a lot of these things are like sensitive, um, uh, just like sort of anything you buy, any sort of tincture or drops of anything are usually in a colored glass bottle. So you want to protect your work. Um, glass measuring cups, beakers. I know it's what I'm thinking glass. Um, these are really cheap. Um, uh, these are, uh, what are these? Part of Orex, I think, but Pyrex. You can get these little um, variegated uh, uh, measuring cups and beakers. If you don't have those, just make sure that your Pyrex or your Fire King this one I just use as a bowl because it's all imperial markings. Um, but, uh, you know, anything like this, uh, these are great because you're sometimes going to be dealing with near boiling or very hot liquids, uh, you know, instantly. So, yeah, sorry, I'm holding up these um, pirate um, speakers and things like that. We want stuff that can handle the heat. Um, I talked about strainers, but also like stainless steel funnels are great. These kinds that are kind of dual purpose that have a little clip in filter are kind of fun. Don't think that you're going to be straining your mark in with that, but it, it's just kind of useful in other ways. Kitchen scissors. I didn't bring my pr my pruning shears uh, to cut the ratio. I don't know if, if you are party. Oh, okay. Um, because uh, when dealing with ratio, um, it's tough. It's really tough. And even like the most hardened pruning shears, these are great because it has this finger chopper right there. Um, so you can really get in there. Um, and we'll talk about dealing with tough mushrooms and how to deal with tough mushrooms as well. And if you're if you're sourcing fresh mushrooms, a food dehydrator is great to have. Um, I have brought a bunch of just foraged and purchased uh, samples of reishi. I'm just going to pass these around. You guys can just pass them around. The uh, big shiny caps are are Chinese cultivated uh, reishi. And then the everything else was just sort of found around Austin, and um, and these are you know these are super tough, and they are um, part of the reason why we have to really put a lot of effort into act like getting access to those things. Um, that demo, that uh, graphic I had of the the stone wall here, um, that chitin, the bricks is. Oh, it's no joke, man. These things are tough. And yet there are some mushrooms that have this incredible tensile and strength that when cooked are just delicious and tender. Um, oyster mushrooms, uh, things like that. Anyway, they come in all forms. Uh, these are just various Ganoderma species, but I think uh, Ling, Lingzer, Lingzi, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce it, the Chinese pronunciation or the Chinese name for the original uh, for a mushroom of life. Um, is the one that uh, I believe is the kind of official reishi, if you will, and and the one that a lot of the, at least the Chinese uh, scientific studies and the Japanese scientific studies were all done using. Um, but we have our own versions of those here. They contain a lot of the same compounds. Some of them are in different concentrations, but we won't get into the weeds of that That's the text taxonomy course. Um, so uh, so yeah, we're just gonna do an overview. I'm not gonna read every one of these. We're gonna do an overview of the various processes that we can use to extract these. I'm gonna tell you what they're for and why. And then we're gonna, I guess, send these out and you'll have these. So don't worry about writing down 40,000 steps. Um, so the, the first one is just the most basic thing in the world, which is this um, single extraction uh, using 80% ethanol. Um, this will get both the lower weight, mostly the lower weight molecular compounds, some of the chitin, some of the alcohol soluble beta glucans, but those are really um, a minimal, a minuscule amount compared to what can be achieved uh, by boiling. <clears throat> but this is something that you can just sort of do really quickly, quickly meaning like a couple of weeks of shaking this thing, squeezing it out, and you've got a picture. Um, 
another sort of similar single step, which can be turned into a double, sort of slightly double step, is just basically boiling them and boiling them to consume them right away. Um, these are some of the, the if, if you notice, uh, I know you're not supposed to be reading this, um, but I, I say here at the top, this is a simple, the single extraction, a simple process that uses any amount of dried mushrooms. So there's no formula here, whatever you have, you know, I like to just sort of eyeball it, basically. Um, this was broken up pretty much, pretty well. This is reishi and lion's mane broken up pretty well. They're not powdered, they're broken up pretty well. And it was, it pretty much filled the jar. And then I put about 200 milliliters of 80% uh, in here. And I got to 80% by using distilled water and um, and the, uh, the, the high, high proof grain alcohol. And I'm going to give you a link to a dilution calculator. So you don't have to be like, what in the world? Um, cause it, it, it's bonkers trying to do that kind of math, at least for me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are going to get all of these. You're going to get all the steps. We'll, we'll put them in an email or something. Yeah. Um, for the, uh, de the decoction, this does have a uh, sort of a target that we're going for, and it's really just um, a formula that just says 20 milliliters of water for every one gram of dried mushroom. And what you're going to end up, you're going to reduce that by half. So you're going to end up with 10 milliliters of liquid of decoction for every one gram. So if you end up with 10, if you start off with 10 grams of, of mushrooms, dried mushrooms, you're gonna add uh, 200 milliliters of water. You're gonna boil that down to 100 milliliters of extract. Um, and you can just sip and enjoy that. You can continue adding water to that. Just leave it in your crock pot or leave it on the stove on the simmer. Just keep adding water to it um, if you want. Um, the, the sort of rule of thumb um, is that if the color is amber or brown and the, the smell is richly of mushrooms and all mushrooms smell richly of mushrooms, so stinkhorns, we're not going to make any extract of stinkhorns. Um, but uh, that is just sort of an indication that you're getting some of those things. There's a lot of the terpenes, a lot of the things, the compounds that are released uh, do have uh, Sort of extra sensory um, uh, or, or, or sensory sort of uh, markers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you just want to consume it that way, you can. Otherwise, you can let it cool down um, to room temperature, squeeze the mark out of there, and uh, add alcohol to bring it up to 25%, which is kind of the bare minimum I would want to have to make something shelf stable. So you can keep it for long term. Um, shelf stable in the mushroom world and in, in the tincture world, it, it just seems to be a moving target. And all, I think a lot of it is because um, companies can't really make claims that they can't um, substantiate so, or don't want to defend. So uh, the, generally, people say two to three years, a shelf stable, keep it in the fridge. It's probably going to last longer. It's in brown glass, in alcohol, you know. Um, it's, it's, you're probably good. But if, if you have a bottle, you know, of tincture that's three years old, throw it away and make a new one or get another hobby because you're, you're not that into it. You're just not that into it. Um, so this is a fun one. This gets into some of the, the good stuff where you're going to do the double extraction. You're going to start with the tincture making, and then you're going to put that tincture aside, squeezing everything out of it, and then put the mark into your boil, boil that. Do the same 10 to 1. Um, this, this time, actually, 10 to 1. Um, and you're going to end up with a 45% alcohol uh, mixture at the end of that, um, which is wildly shelf stable. And you can adjust that just by putting less of the alcohol tincture in there if you want to sort of adjust it yourself. Um, and the one that I do that is the most laborious and time consuming. How many steps? 17 um, is a triple extraction. And this is, uh, 
one that I have here. I have various parts of it here, and you guys can come up and look at these, and we're going to sample them, get little sampling straws. I hope I have 400 of them, as all these people are showing up. Um, uh, but this is a my Turkishi lion, I call it Turkishi lion, because uh, it's uh, half. Turkey, it's 25% Turkish tail, 25% reishi, and 50% lion's mane. Um, this is 80 proof. This was a triple extraction. Um, these, this is an experiment. Um, this is uh, my Turkishi and an earlier four mushroom extract that I had made, uh, which was maitake, tataki, reishi, and turkey tail. And, um, but these are the cold water extracts, uh, but they've been they've been brought up to forty eight uh, proof uh, here, and then uh, the one comes to be somewhere. I don't know, I'll find it. Um, there is uh, anyway. So I want you to taste the difference between the full triple extract and just the cold water extract. Is if they blow your um, the cold water extract, the reason I have this up at 48 is because I actually use this for, for making cocktails and as a bitters, uh, uh, you know, sort of in that stage. So uh, old fashioned, lion's mane old fashions are amazing, amazing. Um, and, and literally arrived at by soaking dried lion's mane mushrooms not dry, but dried lion's mane mushrooms in distilled water for 24 hours in the fridge and then extracting. Um, that is not stable anywhere. It's not stable in your fridge. It's not stable on the shelf. So as soon as that 24 hours is up, you got to get that in the freezer fast. And that's going to freeze anything that's already started happening. So if you're wild foraging, you want to think about what you're going to be diluting. All right. Now, the way I do it, the, the water, and we're going to get into the process there, but just a little bit of background about that, because I'm a fermenter as well. And you're, fer you're fermenting things, whether you see the results of it or not, uh, uh, you're fermenting things. You're creating an anaerobic environment where things that are usual, used to living out in the air and breathing oxygen, you know, uh, die. And, and are no longer flourishing. And the things that don't live in that environment are going, yes, and they come out. And a lot of those are baddies. So uh, we have to kill the baddies once that process is done. So I do 24 hours in the fridge. So I put ice cold uh, um, uh, uh, distilled water in mine. Um, it never, it's never lower than, you know, 38 degrees or whatever, and then immediately freeze it afterwards. So we'll go through the process of that, but yeah, basically a cold water soak followed by the tincture making followed by the decoction, and then you can make the cocktail, uh, however you want. If you do it with this formula, you will end up with around 25% alcohol, 50 proof, which is pretty good. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so, uh, let's just make sure that we always stay true to our beliefs. And, um, like I said, hold these people's feet to the fire. Uh, we're all excited about mushrooms. I'm, I will challenge any of you who is more excited about mushrooms than me. <laughs> challenge any one of you a cage match. Um, but, uh, but I also live in the real world. And these things, uh, there are people who are depending on some of these things, right? Um, I'm doing it as a preventative, as, you know, something that will hopefully help me in my later years, right? Because of my, my uh, uh, very young appearance right now. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, while I am at the same time still skeptical, of a lot of claims. Um, but the, 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 the good news is that there is a lot of research. A lot of research is available. I'll get to me in a sec. Um, there's, a, a, there's some great places to go, like the uh, PubMed Central, 
um, National Library of Medicine. Um, these things are all published here and made available, or rather published in various journals made available here for free. Um, they are peer reviewed. And depending on what it is that you are looking for, let's say I'm just gonna type in the word beta blue can. I'll hyphenate it and see how good their search engine is. And there are uh, blah, blah, blah. Does it say that there's 45,000 results of, th of, of things that are beta glucans? Now, there's various ways uh, that you can filter here. I'm not going to show you how to use this, but basically the year of publication, I only want things that were published within the last year, within the last five years, right? Um, I can look for specific funders. I only want NIH grants, right? And various other things that you can do. Um, and then each one of these will tell you, uh, let's just say from cancer therapy to winemaking, the molecular structure and application of beta-glucans and beta-glucans 1,3 glucanase. Um, you can also look at these, check the dates, look at the authors, look at the funders, See how many times it's been cited by other articles. You can click in this link down here in PubMed and it'll give you a count. This has been cited eight times, right? At least as far as PubMed, the things that have been released in PubMed. So I tend to go back and forth here, clicking back and forth, looking at things like who was the funder of this particular research. Here's host defense. Here's those defense going on and on and on about why they are the my, mycelium is the future, right? And it's there it is. Hey, look at that. Remember that? And then what is even a little chalky like, little whiteboard infographics? Look at that. The mushroom life cycle. I should have stolen theirs. Don't post this. Um, there's evidence. There's more stuff. There's scientists working on the evidence. Look at that. It's it's camp. It's got to be real. Um, that's exactly what it looks like. And uh, here's the processes, here's what they do. And then it's like peer reviewed study verifies that fermented rice substrate, even when separated from pure mycelium supports natural immune function. That's cool, I'll start fermenting rice later and another time. Talk about the mushrooms. Oh, the immune supporting benefits of mushrooms are generated from a wide range of constituents, not just beta glucans. Hey, hey I'm, I'm on the right track. Um, and then you go, all right, where's the research? Where's that research? Here, breakthrough research right here. Let's click on that breakthrough research. There it is. Efficacy of mushrooms, rice substrate, rice substrate confirmed. You know, like, yes, you know, USA. You know, like, it's like exclamation point. I mean, was there like a sigh of relief when this thing was published? Like, oh my God. Oh boy. Let's read more about the research here. Oh, we're on PR Newswire. Hang on a sec. There's a press release. All right. The immune benefits of blah, 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 blah. blah. Oh, wait, there's Paul Stamets. I'm not going to do the video. Oh, wait, wait, here it is. Finally got to the research. All right, fine. Oh, no, it's a, a blocking me because it's tracking my information. I'm finally going to get there. And here we are. Oh, bad. Look at that. Wait, 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 wait. This is a long one, too. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, so this is Biomed Central, uh, the, the longest article in history. Uh, it's got 20 citations. Uh, here's Paul Stam. He's with Paul Stam. This is one of the one of the researchers in the thing hang on mm -hmm. and then you're like you look scroll down here and you look at the funding and the fun study was funded by fungi perfect the llc oh, look at that. these people funded this study and then you're looking at the authors and their affiliations and the contributors and you know, i like how they do like ps paul stamets um and uh yada 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 these people work here these people swear that it's cool and all that all right, so yes, and there's an ethics declaration at the bottom. Um, so again, you're you're on your own, you know. But but there's it, the stuff is out there. The information's out there. The way to get to it is out there, and um, and you're all like seemingly curious, intelligent people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, and so uh, I'll give you all these research uh, resources here and whatnot. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm on Instagram, uh, but I'm linked on to all the other things from CPMS and whatnot. 
But yeah, let's, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take like five minutes, get this thing set up in kind of an assembly line, and maybe we'll go like row by row and everybody will be able to come up here, get your stuff. Maybe we can get a beer, you know, because we're parched. And, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into like the actual demonstration part of it here. Yes, question. I'm sorry, and thank you for asking that. So yes, uh, alcohol alternatives, if people don't wanna use alcohol, totally understand that. Um, I have never tried it, but there is lots of information out there about that. And that's gonna be one of those things that is probably, you're gonna probably have to find some analog research that is sort of like, well, these are the components, they're bound by this or whatever, they can be released using glycerin. So it, you know, common sense might indicate that it, it's effective, right? Um, but I would totally love to hear if you do this, I would love to hear if it works. Yeah, um, because yeah, I mean, the, the alcohol is just what science and chemistry uses, um, mostly just because it's, it's really a, a, an amazing solvent. Yes. Um, vinegars, I mean, you know, the, the things, so long as I think the dilution is right, I think that, um, I think there's probably some things that, that the acids can break down. Um, I'm just not sure about um, the way that, uh, the ethanol is weakening the, the cell structure. It would make sense that like just packing these things in salt, you know, would, would do something. Um, I just don't know of any research around that, but I would love to find out if you do something and that works. Um, but, uh, but and, and fermented, you know, I mean, like live, the whole thing. Um, there, there is some stuff around fermenting mushrooms. It's kind of like, you know, two worlds that are that want to be together so much and they're really kind of weird when you put them together um so uh yes i would love to know that any other question yes instead of um oh yeah so i'm gonna talk about drying um and the sort of the things you need to know about drying them um, I don't see a problem with freeze drying. Um, it, you know, heat is the bigger problem, but then, you know, I'm not really familiar with any research around uh, extreme cold temperatures. I know there's a lot of, around heat uh, damaging things, even in the drying process, heat can damage like lion's mane, herisium. Uh, the phenolic compounds can be lost in the drying. So you have to dry those at super low temperature. Uh, for a long time, but I would love to find out if you freeze dry things and let me know. Anybody else? Yes. Uh huh. Oh, good question. So always dried mushrooms, and the only reason is because mushrooms are up to ninety-five percent water. And so you're trying to use uh, uh, an incredible solvent to break things down that are in the, the cell walls. Um, and as it sounds ridiculous, but there is a rehydration process before you do the ethanol. You know, but you said not to use fresh mushrooms. Um, uh, and, and I think there is also a physical process that happens during the drying that also potentially damages the cells a little bit and makes them a little easier to crack. Um, don't hang my hat on that, but I, I believe I have read that. Um, so yes, but drying at a low temperature is always preferred in anything you do um, with mushrooms um, because the heat is cooking them whether you realize it or not. Yes. Right. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh huh. 
Uh, I haven't though. I know there's a lot of it in there and my old one would work just fine. And the only thing I would change is I didn't have a thermostat and a temperature regulator on it or anything like that. So I had to just sort of try different wattage light bulbs, you know, this is before LED CFLs or whatever. So I think I got down to like one of those refrigerator light bulbs, you know, the, like the 10 watt or some ridiculous because the thing was so insulated and the, the, I lined the whole thing with aluminum foil, you know, so it was just a hot box. Uh, I had to, I had to, the first batch rotted because I didn't vent it, you know, like every, just so, so much trial and error. Um, but I know that um, I was using uh, uh, cookie uh, cooling uh, grills or whatever, you know, uh, cookie uh, cooling racks, baking racks, uh, because I just didn't think to just stretch my own, you know, mesh screen, like window screen or whatever, and just make one the size. It would have been so easy. Um, but I think, you know, it's just really what you have on hand. Um, I have one of those you know, big stackable, you know, whatever, the one that everybody uses, you know, um, that I've had for 30 years still works, you know, perfectly. Um, but uh, but I am making my own laminar flow hood. And so I am in the sort of headspace of airflow and things like that. So um, that'll be another workshop for another day. Yes. You are, and we can talk about that basically at the end of all of this decoction phase. Um, you will you will end up with a paste, and the more that you break this stuff down, right? If you get it into a powdered form, you can then just use your little jerky trays or whatever you use for jerky making or fruit leather making, and spread out your your uh, uh, you know extract and dehydrate it just like that. And then you can just break it up in a food processor or whatever you have. Um, so yeah, you can do that, make your own pills. Doesn't have to be in a liquid form. Uh, in fact, a lot of the Western gurus are talking about, you just, you know, you're, you're missing opportunities and whatnot. It's like, you know, I have a certain amount of time <laughs> and just take it easy, mushroom guys. Speaking of mushroom guys, um, I'll go ahead and just uh, uh, throw these up here. You know, this, these are the, the shoulders that everyone is standing. Peter McCoy's, um, you know, seminal work about radical mythology is the, the triple extract uh, uh, method that I still use today. And this book was when? What year is this? Uh, 2016 is when this was published. So still holds up. Um, and this is like everything to do with every form of mushroom. Um, we all know about Paul Stam, it's my cell room running. He goes into some of the early stuff, but this is like 2004, I believe, 2005. Um, so these are still good, you know, good to just sort of, nothing is wrong in here. It's just not up to date, right? Um, this was, this used to be the sort of Bible of the whole thing. Oh, shoot. I do have that. Yeah. Let me stop the share. And let me put this here. There we go. Look, for all of you at home. Look at that. This is Rogers Fungal Pharmacy. I'm going to go backwards here. So we started with Peter McCoy, Radical Mycology. That uh, is the, you know, look at that. It literally has the things on the, the markings, like a, a dictionary or a Bible. Um, uh, mycelium running was the other one. Paul Stamets, uh, you know, again, our mushrooms can help say as well. Yeah, they will. They will help us. Um, uh, Rogers, uh, fungal, the fungal pharmacy, Robert Rogers. Uh, this is now, let me just say, uh, 2011. So this is, you know, the, the research in here is as is, is new as 12 years old, but most of it is still valid. It's just that we know so much more. Um, but what's great about this book is it's it's literally just all the mushrooms. And it's a great book for identifying. It's a great book for, you know, just general mushroom information. And um, it's also a, an insane amount of citations in here. Um, so at the time, 
and 2011, he's, these are all the citations for every sort of indication that's been uh, specified for each one of these mushrooms. And it's just an insane amount. Uh, fortunately, and even if you're curious, uh, you can look these up on PubMed Central or, or any one of those things, and they're all there. Um, and then the, the most recent one that seems to be the most useful and helpful right now is uh, Christopher Hobbs Medicinal Mushrooms. Um, this is really good. It's a good how-to. Um, it's, you know, kind of like, like uh, you know, vegan desserts. You know, it's like one of these, you know, books. But he shows you a lot of processes, good, good pictures. Mary, look at him. He doesn't need a potato rice. He's squeezing it with his hands. That's how good, that's how healthy mushrooms are. Oh, look, here's a part about making dried powder extract right there. Um, but it's, uh, again, it's another one that just sort of like covers a lot of ground. Um, yes, he does get into some of the psychedelic stuff and all that. Yes, this will be in my, um, I linked to his research gate page in our, uh, our the thing we're going to send out because he has some good, Good articles there. Um, and then I am going down a separate rabbit hole, but this has been really helpful. This is a tiny little book here uh, called A Very Short Introduction, uh, Nicholas P. Money. And this book is like literally like that tiny, um, but it's fantastic and it's way above my pay grade, but that's kind of where I need to be right now with all this stuff. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to get this all set up so that this all makes sense. Um, one last thing that I didn't show you when equipment wise was potato ricers. And I'm just going to do this. Okay, which one of these is a potato ricer? Which one I should say, which one of these is not a potato ricer? The one, which one? The one, your left, my left. The white one, the white one is not a potato rice. You're right. This is a piece of plastic garbage. <laughs> That's a piece of plastic garbage. There's some metal. There's like one piece of metal. The rest of it is a piece of plastic garbage. This is a potato rice. All right. And this is the easiest way to put your little thing in there and squeeze it out and get everything that you want out of there. Um, but if you don't have that, they said before, the bowl and pot method. You know, press down on that. Everything is in there. Good. All right. Um, let's get started. Yeah. Um, let's do, you figure it's going to pull. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, we're going to demonstrate. I kind of. All right. Yeah, so we can do that while we're. All right. So, yeah, we're going to take five, get set up for the thing, and then. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think we Yeah. Okay. Can you just kind of state that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're going to. Uh, be setting it up. Uh, we're gonna get the ingredients for your little thingamajig here. We're gonna have some beakers and stuff that we can measure all of the ingredients. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about step-by-step -step processes. But first we're gonna grab a beverage. Oh, okay. You want to grab your ingredient? You want to go ahead and just. You want to grab this one? This one is what everybody's got to do. And it's already, you know, at least a week old. Absolutely. That's what you're going to work with. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think that's great. So just right. Yeah, it's Yeah, it's good. You're here on the stage. Yeah, it's good. 